Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Doc to Doc podcast. This is part one of a two part series on colon cancer. In part one, we'll have an educational lecture type format about colon cancer. In part two, we'll talk about what you can do to prevent yourself and your family from being diagnosed with this disease, and we'll offer some opinions on this subject. Hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the Doc to Doc podcast. I'm Rob Hoyer, medical oncologist. And my name is Abbas Shafi, gastroenterologist. This is a podcast about lifestyle medicine, disease prevention, and longevity. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only. It is not medical advice. Please consult your physician for personalized therapy and advice. Our goal is to enable individuals to become CEO of their uh, health by managing their diet, exercise, sleep, and stress to prevent a common disease. Hi, everybody. Today we're going to talk about colon cancer and just some general facts about colon cancer. It is the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States. And in 2019, we saw about 51,000 deaths from colon cancer. About 140,000 people are diagnosed with colon cancer annually. And presently there are about 1 million, uh, over actually 1 million colon cancer survivors in the US. Uh, risk of colon cancer is slightly, slightly higher in males, and about 1 in 20 men will have colon cancer in their lifetime, and about 1 in 24 women. And uh, the majority, uh, the vast majority of people diagnosed with colon cancer are over age 50. Uh, that is changing a little bit, but even with uh, recent trends that we've seen higher uh, incidence of colon cancer before the age of 50, still the majority of the people diagnosed with colon cancer are over 50. So looking at the rates of colon cancer per 100,000 people, and this is a common way that uh, epidemiologists or folks who study disease look at the different incidences of different diseases, we do see a higher incidence of colon cancer in African-American men and women. We're not quite sure what that is, and there may be genetic factors and also potentially environmental factors behind that. Um, that's something that's been seen. So the uh, um, African-Americans who have a higher risk of colon cancer, and uh, we see actually slightly lower risk of colon cancer in Hispanic, Asians, and uh, Native Americans, and Alaskans relative to Caucasians. The anatomical distribution of colon cancer um, is... Uh uh, very interesting. Initially, we thought it was mostly uh, related to the left colon, but in recent studies, we have shown that uh, um, the colon cancer distribution is throughout the, the colon. Uh, the left colon is still majority, about 54%, and the uh, um, ascending colon uh, and cecum, about 33%, and transverse colon, which is in between the two, is about 13%, um, and then uh, the rectum, about 29%. The Colorectal cancer um, majority is a sporadic. Um, however, there's a subclass of a, a family and certain syndromes, such as Lynch syndromes, um, as well as other um, inherited uh, um, polyposis syndrome. But those are account for minority uh, of the colon cancer in the United States. The colon uh, cancer uh, uh, distribution throughout the world um, is um, uh, quite uh, interesting. Uh, the people in uh, Sub-Sahara uh, in Africa, uh, as well as a certain part of um, Asia, they have the minority, while the um, Australian, as uh, well as the uh, uh, United States and part of Europe, uh, has uh, the, the highest incident um, in um, uh, distribution through the Asia. Again, is different from genetic um, group to others such as Korean is higher than the remaining of the uh, remaining of the Asian. And I, I just wanted to comment too, it is really striking and we can we'll include these slides in the in the show notes about how low the incidence is in the African countries and perhaps some of it may be from shorter life expectancy, perhaps, but the and also higher risk of infectious diseases and whatnot, but 
that it's really striking. I mean, it's dramatically. It's some, like we see if the incidence per hundred thousand of in Australia forty five point seven, and in Africa we're in the fours and fives. It's, I thought it was kind of interesting. That is very, and also the interesting thing is when you bring African American to United States and introduce them to the Western diet, then the colon cancer risk goes much much higher. That's another interesting, I think, study is to be done. Why the same genetic group that majority they still have. Um, a, a good mixture of uh, African genes that how low it is. So the environment and diet and that I think it plays a huge role in uh, colon cancer. Um, death rate has been de- decreasing for both uh, male and female with uh, colon cancer um, uh, above age 50. However, uh, we see the increase in number of uh, colon cancer below age 50. So there are some really interesting epidemiological trends in colon cancer that we we don't see in other diseases, and we're not really sure why this is, but we'll, we'll start out by describing what, the, uh, what we're seeing with uh, colon cancer incidence changing in different age groups, and then we'll, we'll talk about potentially why why that is, we really don't know, but we'll have a discussion. So since the 1990s, the rate of colon cancer, so that and that's colon and, re- and rectal cancer, has more than doubled among adults younger than 50. But not only that, the, the, the disease is more aggressive when we see it in younger individuals, and more, more of those individuals are dying from the disease. And it's really, the, the really striking thing about that is that the, uh, the incidence of colon cancer in adults over 50 is is decreasing steadily. That may be due to increases in screening. And so when when when, uh, when Dr. Shafi talks about the the um, use of screening for colonoscopy, we'll talk about how that how that works and how the adenoma, adenoma polyps can be removed, thus preventing the disease. But we're seeing uh, the uh, higher rates of colon cancer in younger individuals, and it, it, the number the numbers are 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 getting steadily larger. So this this um, this year, about eighteen thousand people under the age of fifty will be di- diagnosed with colon cancer. It, it's still uh, a relatively small cause of death in younger adults. Um, much fewer than one one percent of younger adults will 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 have uh, colon cancer and and die from the disease. However, it really does suggest that there could be environmental factors and lifestyle factors that are playing a role here. And uh, we really don't know why this is, but the but we can likely say this is probably not genetic because genetics doesn't doesn't change in in years or decades. Genetics is something that changes over a very long span of time, typically generations, hundreds of years. We can see we can see changes in genetic risk among different groups. But this is likely lifestyle and there's been hypotheses that the microbiome, that's the uh, microbiology environment, the bacteria and other organisms that inhabit our gut maybe are, are, well, we know they are changing and that dietary patterns have changed pretty dramatically over the last 50 years in the U.S. So that's one hypothesis. Um, also, sedentary behavior is also a factor. So there's a couple studies that have linked, or one study in particular that's linked uh, duration of TV to higher risk of colon cancer. So the more TV you watch, the higher the risk. And uh, obesity is also a factor. So ob- obese individuals have a higher risk of colon cancer. There's also questions about other um, environmental factors, for example, pesticides, food additives, these other uh, toxins in the environment may be playing a role. And it's it's quite interesting that when you look at the statistics, we're seeing actually higher risks of rectal cancer. The rectum is is a the colon itself, but the rectum specifically is more of a storage area for the for the stool. And so Perhaps there is something that is um, interacting with the wall of the uh, rectum 
and that is giving a higher risk of, of colon and rectal cancer in, in younger adults. This trend is really concerning in that we're, uh, all our screening is focused on uh, historically above age 50. Recently, American Cancer Society and other groups did, uh, did recommend to reduce the age to start screening age to age 45. My suspicion is that that probably will reduce even more to age 40 in the coming years. And, uh, and, we'll, have, and we'll, we'll have some other discussion about this as well. The next we'll talk about screening. Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Roy, the colon cancer uh, as well as rectal cancer, as you mentioned, in young uh, uh, individuals is quite concerning uh, with uh, uh, many uh, you know, um, commercialization of the food. Um, we see uh, um, other changes in the GI tract and probably a microbiome plays a big role. Um, even the individual that has uh, stopped smoking, which should decrease the colon cancer, as uh, we eat a healthier food in a somewhat healthier environment. But however, this uh, uh, colon cancer in young uh, uh, age is quite uh, concerning and hopefully we'll have some solution in the future. The um, colon cancer um, symptoms is a, a, is a, a very, very rare and it's only in the late stages the colon polyps and early uh, and early colon cancer they have no symptoms uh, the symptoms may include um, in the late stages abdominal pain change in bowel habits uh, have a um, uh, blood in stool um, anemia uh, weight loss uh, uh, and, uh, and in some cases we'll see the uh, spread to the other part of the body as a uh, First symptoms. Um, these are uh, uh, a part of, uh, um, as a rare but um, occasional symptoms of the colon cancer. Sometimes they show as a um, fever or unknown origin, um, uh, as or sometimes a localized inflammation of the colon. Um, majority of the symptoms that we see is mostly related to the left colon, which has a more narrower or smaller lumen. The right side colon. We have quite advanced disease even before any uh, symptoms. The exact cause of colon cancer is unknown, but certain um, risk factor can con uh, contribute to increased uh, um, chance of uh, getting colon cancer. Uh, in the normal process, um, when we have a normal colon mucosa, by Increasing the risk factor, which will go more in detail, the mucosa will start changing and subsequently develop to uh, polyp, um, which the polyp can be a different histology, commonly there are adenoma or variation of that, and subsequently over 7 to 10 years from the beginning to the end process uh, will become colon cancer. And again, as mentioned before, the early colon cancer has no symptoms when it become moderate to severe, then depending on the location, we will have on some uh, uh, symptoms. So the traditional way a colon cancer develops is as a, a small clump of cells, what we call a polyp. Not all colon cancers proceed through a polyp stage, but the majority do. And these polyps, we call them adenomas. That's the medical term for a, for a colon polyp. And it's thought that these may occur from inflammation in the in the gut, uh, perhaps a change in the microbiology of the of the uh, colon in that in that um, area, causing inflammation, causing the polyp. Um, there have been several studies that show that high fat, high um, high red meat, and processed food uh, may be a contributing factor, or is a contributing factor to colon cancer. Fiber. Is, uh, has been shown to be protective, and higher uh, doses or higher amounts of fiber in the diet have been shown to be beneficial. So this is something that's really key, is that fiber is protective, and uh, there's a couple different types of fiber, uh, both soluble and insoluble fiber. So the I like to think of the insoluble fiber as the, we, call, we often think of as roughage or the traditional uh, metamucil that you uh, get a scoop of and dissolve in a glass of water, that's your insoluble fiber. 
you actually can see the fiber in the in the the liquid when you when it's when it's uh, when you try to dissolve it. It really doesn't dissolve very well at all. Um, the other type of fiber that doesn't get quite as much attention is called soluble fiber. And soluble fiber, there's actually hundreds of thousands of different types of soluble fiber, and that is derived exclusively from plant-based foods. There's no other way to get fiber other than plants. And fiber is one of the main foods for the microbiology, the microbiome of our, of our intestines. And we often call this the prebiotic. So soluble fiber is a very important prebiotic, and it is the food for the probiotics, which then uh, yields postbiotics, and that those postbiotics are important for reducing inflammation. So if you don't get enough fiber in your diet, you'll have a, a different microbiome, and uh, then thus different postbiotics are generated because of the, uh, the change in the micro microbiology of the colon. So fiber is really important, and it's uh, widely, widely established that Americans uh, really get uh, just a, a fraction. Uh, most individuals get less than 20% of the uh, recommended amount of daily, daily dietary fiber. So regardless of what diet you follow, fiber is really, really helpful and protective. So I really encourage uh, getting enough fiber. And we'll, we'll talk more about that later in the podcast about ways to ways to um, prevent uh, uh, yourself or your family from, from getting colon cancer and also also potentially other, other cancers as well. So some of the um, well-known risk factors for colon cancer include age. We talked about African-Americans having a higher risk of colon cancer, personal or family history of colon polyps, uh, family history of colon cancer, particularly a first-degree relative will have a higher um, will, have, will, will, will impart a higher risk in the family of having colon cancer, inflammatory bowel disease. So it's not a, not a big surprise that inflammation in the small and large intestine will, will be associated with a higher risk of colon cancer, previous radiation therapy to the abdomen or pelvis, obesity we talked about as a risk factor, diabetes, sedentary lifestyle. Um, we talked about diet previously. And uh, smoking and alcohol use also have been linked. Particularly heavy alcohol use has been shown to be a risk factor for, for colon cancer. Uh, colon cancer screening. This is always a, a confusing topic, both for primary care physician as well as a, a patient, uh, which method to use and uh, how to proceed at what age. Uh, as Dr. Hoyer mentioned, uh, previously, we were screening people for uh, colon cancer screen at age 50. Um, however, in recent years, we have a, a, a decrease at age 45, and in future, uh, uh, maybe be lower. So in general, to uh, clarify some of the confusion, um, we divide people in two groups. And each individual can even look at themselves, whether they're in high-risk group or low-risk group. The high-risk groups... Um, they are straightforward. You need visualization. You need to prevention um, from early stage. So you get colonoscopy. So the high risk groups um, in, include that pe previously had significant polyp, people with families of colon cancer, people with inflammatory bowel disease, um, also uh, family heredity, a history of colon cancer, such as Lynch syndrome um, and uh, non polyposis cancer uh, syndrome. Um, so those are, uh, as well as people with radiation uh, to the abdomen and pelvic. So, so this group called high-risk groups. So they should not be done stool testing or colon guard or other tests. They should go for straight visualization of the colon. However, there are people with uh, any other group that they are called low-risk groups. I mean, average people with have no symptoms. They have no family history. At that age, 45, they have choices to do. One choice to do colonoscopy, the other one do barium enema or other radiology studies that they can do called virtual colonoscopy. They can do flexosigmoidoscopy, which previously very, was very common, or do stool testing for hidden blood, such as called FIT or, or cold blood, and the newer test called Coligar, which is a combination of DNA as well as uh, FIT. Each of these uh, tests is depend on the uh, local availability uh, for as well as uh, um, 
uh, as well as a, a patient uh, uh, willing to uh, take some of the risks. Of course, colonoscopy uh, should be done every eight to ten years. If the colon is well prepped, is the gold standard to see if there's any polyp at the same time we can take it out. Um, the downside fall of that, it is required uh, one to two days of cleansing as well as, um, you know, the risk of sedation and and um, uh, complication of colonoscopy, which is very, very low, but that's uh, um, one standard, uh, golden standard to do every eight to ten years. Other tests we choose not to do is a barium enema. The cleansing for that is the same, uh, except this is done uh, while you're awake uh, by... Uh, putting a barium, which is a contrast we do with some um, air to follow, that maps the colon. If your colon is nice and clean, that can be repeated every uh, five years. Um, virtual colonoscopy, again, the preparation are similar, but you need to have a very good radiologist that be able to to uh, read that. That's probably going to get more popular as uh, we get more uh, expertise in this uh, uh, field. Flexible sigmoidoscopy, we examined the, the, uh, the last one-third of the, uh, the colon. Um, this is similar to colonoscopy with a similar type of prep. It can be done without sedation. However, the uh, proximal colon, the, 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 the right colon and the transverse colon um, uh, can be mixed. And that if you do that, then you should do that every five years and probably an annual either a fit or a cold blood. The old cold blood is shows any hidden blood in the GI tract, uh, anywhere from a, a nosebleed to uh, hemorrhoids can cause that, but mostly we're looking for any cold bleeding um, through the GI tract. That's mostly be done for, for anemia, uh, with people with low uh, um, blood uh, or hemoglobin. So that, that can detect either clonic or upper uh, GI uh, origin. There's another test called a FIT uh, test, which is a fecal immune uh, and testing that this is mostly um, through the clonic um, origin bleed, but however, um, uh, this is more specific to the colon. And uh, the colon guard is a combination of fit as well as uh, uh, DNA. Um, this test uh, um, at present time is very expensive, somewhere seven, eight hundred dollars, and uh, unfortunately has a lot of false positive, at least in. Um, present setting and what we see. And uh, once you have positive colgard, it's um, both for patient as well as the gastroenterologist is um, tough to explain why this was positive. Hopefully in future we have a better method to uh, for this accuracy. But any test for screening is better than none. So, so any screening test is best, but if you talk to your individual physician, if you're at low risks, those are all viable options to choose based on the local expertise and availability. After the initial um, uh, screening test, um, and then uh, uh, based on the, uh, again, local expertise and availability, um, if you had a colonoscopy or had a polyp, uh, the follow-up exam is based on the number of the polyp and the size, as well as another really important factor is uh, how clean and the colon cleansing was, as well as uh, the difficulty of the colonoscopy. Um, patient with previous abdominal surgery uh, or previous radiation, uh, it, it make it technically more difficult to see um, the uh, bend or, or, or flexure of the colon. So, so based on those uh, factors, um, the physician can recommend a follow-up uh, colonoscopy in a, in a uh, absolute uh, favorable situation then can be done every eight to ten years. Um, again, if you do annual stool test, should be done um, yearly. Barium enema um, every five years. Uh, Colgard every uh, three years. Um, if you combine some of these things, some people combine um, barium enema and the cold blood uh, test yearly. So if any of those tests become positive, then you have to start again with uh, uh, colonoscopy. So the next topic we'll talk about is what we call the T, N, and M staging. And so this is a, a staging system that oncologists and other cancer specialists use to stage cancer. So we'll just briefly go through this. And it's something we'll actually be talking about in future podcasts as well. So the T stage is has to do with the 
uh, the size and also the uh, depth of, of tumors. And this, in, for the case of, in the case of colon and rectal cancer, it actually is the, not, it's not actually the size, but the depth of the tumor into the uh, colon, which has, colon has multiple layers, including a, a very uh, strong muscle layer as, uh, as it needs to move the stool through uh, the, the, in, the intestine, through the lumen of the intestine. And so the deeper the cancer gets, uh, either close to, into, or through the muscle, has to do with the, what's called the T stage of, of the cancer. And then we have what's called the N stage, which is the lymph node. So uh, the lymph nodes in the colon are mainly there for uh, part of the immune system, and they actually are kind of like our, our surveillance network in our body, looking for any evidence of infection, bacteria, viruses, other infections. They also happen to catch cancer cells, and so it's well established that usually, not always, but usually uh, when the cancer, uh, before the cancer spreads to other parts of the body, it will actually move to a lymph node first. That's not always the case, but that's usually, that's, that's the majority of situations. It will spread to the lymph node first. And so we can look at the number of lymph nodes that are involved with the cancer and determine uh, the, the stage. So when we see the cancer spread to a, a one or more lymph nodes, that automatically means the cancer is stage three or higher. And so that's, so we have different types of different stages of stage three, A, B, and C, uh, which has to do with the depth of the tumor into the wall of the intestine and the number of lymph nodes involved. And then finally, we have stage uh, four disease, which is advanced. So that can be spread to the liver, lung, or other parts of the body. For colon cancer, mainly it's liver and lung spread. And with all these different staging groups, uh, so from all the way from stage zero to stage four, what, what, what those are are actually what's called prognostic groups. So uh, researchers, when looking at uh, the different, uh, different uh, distributions of colon cancer in different individuals, can actually give a prognosis or how, how that person, that individual will do based on the stage of the cancer. So uh, stage uh, zero and one cancers have the best survival, with stage four having the worst, and stage two and three in between that. And so it, it's it's obviously it, it's not um, it's not hundred doesn't work hundred percent of the time, but it's pretty good to determine uh, the the chances of cure after surgery, which is the mainstay of treatment for colon cancer, removal of that section of the colon, and then reattaching the colon um, whenever possible. Occasionally, patients will have to have a colostomy or a bag uh, on, on the abdomen. Uh, that's when the when the colon cannot be reattached, we take great care to try to avoid that whenever possible. So the mainstay treatment for colon and rectal cancer is surgery. In uh, select situations, particularly with rectal cancer, we'll, op we'll often recommend use of radiation therapy either before or after uh, surgery. Uh, for rectal cancer, usually that radiation and sometimes chemotherapy is given prior to surgery and then surgery is performed. After uh, surgery for colon or rectal cancer, we will look at the pathology report, which is what the surgeon removed, and then it goes to the pathologist who then looks at the, the uh, depth of the tumor invasion into the wall of the intestine, looks at the lymph nodes or other areas of spread of the cancer within, within or around the intestine, and gives us a stage. And we then do scans, CAT scans typically, to see if the cancer is spread to other parts of the body. And for patients with stages two and in particular three colon cancer, we will often make a recommendation for chemotherapy, what we call adjuvant chemotherapy. And that chemotherapy is given to reduce the risk of recurrence. And the idea between, behind adjuvant chemotherapy is that we're trying to attack Small, cell, small cancer cells or small clusters of cancer cells that have spread beyond the colon into lymph nodes uh, that have not been removed or other parts of the body. And we're trying to attack those cancer cells before they can spread and develop into tumors. And so the use of adjuvant chemotherapy has been proven to reduce the risk of a colon cancer recurrence for patients with stage two and stage three disease 
we're uh, we're just starting to use uh, some a technology which is very fascinating called the circulating tumor DNA analysis. And so what what this is is looking at minute amounts of uh, DNA from the cancer within the patient's bloodstream. And uh, there's a couple different companies that are doing this, in particular one called Signaterra. And what's been shown is that individuals with a positive Signaterra test after resection of colon colonorectal cancer have a higher risk of a recurrence. Uh, patients with uh, uh, sequential negative Signaterra results have a lower risk of recurrence and actually may not need chemotherapy. And so this is a really interesting use of the technology to uh, refine uh, the risk associated with stage two and, uh, and, and stage three colon cancer. So we're very excited about use of these circulating tumor DNA uh, tests. So what happens when a patient is diagnosed with colon cancer at our institution is that we meet at what's called a tumor board or tumor conference and have a discussion about that individual. We look at that individual's uh, risk factors, other health conditions, and recommend the course of treatment. And that uh, it, discussion occurs with the patient. So the patient is very much an active part of that conversation in terms of what treatment yeah, they, they, will, they will have for their particular disease. It's, it's very much individualized. It's not a one-size-fits-all. And so it really is more detailed than we can cover today. However, I'll, I'll just say that each individual is unique, and we really have to balance the risk and benefit of the treatments. One of the concerns, um, both uh, from patients and also the physicians, is the risks and side effects of the cancer treatment. And uh, after seeing quite a few patients with colon cancer go through the different parts of the treatment, it's actually one of the reasons that I've uh, decided to focus on lifestyle medicine because of all the side effects associated with these therapies. For example, with uh, colon resection, uh, patients may have chronic diarrhea or change in bowel habits, more frequent uh, stools. With uh, re uh, chemotherapy and radiation therapy, there can be a number of lasting side effects. For example, one of the big ones uh, we see, one of the big side effects we see is with a drug called oxaliplatin can cause neuropathy, which is a numbness in the fingertips, uh, hands, and uh, toes that can extend up into the feet and legs. This can be permanent. And what we've done to try to reduce some of the neuropathy risk is to shorten some of our chemotherapy regimens from six months to three months. That reduces the risk of neuropathy with oxaliplatin, however, does not totally prevent it. So the long-term side effects can be significant after a diagnosis of colon and rectal cancer. We'll talk about survivorship here in a few minutes, but this is something that we do our best to try to balance risk and benefit of these treatments, trying to get the, uh, the best possible survival with the least amount of risk. After the initial diagnosis of uh, a colon cancer and treatment with surgery and possible chemotherapy, um, the risk of colon cancer recurrence um, in other parts of the colon is still uh, is high. So uh, after the treatment, patient need to have a, a routine follow-up done um, initially with blood work and CAT scan and then with a colonoscopy. Uh, we recommend a colonoscopy um, post-resection uh, um, six months to a year. Uh, the first uh, um, examination, then after it was normal, uh, after three years, uh, then subsequently every five years. Uh, because we see the patient uh, through the uh, uh, the lifespan uh, post resection, develop circularized lesion as well as develop polyps. So if we can remove the polyps at the earlier time, then chance of getting second uh, cancer can be uh, prevented. Okay. Bas, could you define what a synchronous lesion is? When um, patient they have uh, more than 
uh, one cancer in their colon. So, so some individual, they will have uh, two different segments of the colon with uh, two individual cancers. So, so, so those are called serial lesion. Also, then subsequently, you can have, um, for example, if you had the rectal cancer, um, and follow-up exam, I have seen people have sickle cancer. So, so, so those are very important to follow up, so pre preventing getting the, a secondary cancer. Okay. In summary, uh, colon, uh, colorectal cancer is very common. Um, colon cancer in majority of time starts uh, from um, early polyp, um, and uh, polyp and early cancer, they have very less symptoms. Um, the early detection is the key for long survival. Um, uh, fortunately, a colorectal cancer can be prevented by a patient uh, uh, education, especially with diet, lifestyle uh, modification, as I uh, mentioned early uh, uh, screening. So one of the key areas that we've been focusing in the oncology world over the last 15, 20 years is something called survivorship. So as we talked about earlier, there are over a million survivors of colon and rectal cancer in the United States today, which is a huge number. And I, I think that's a, you know, really a, a wonderful thing that more and more people are surviving this disease and we're catching it earlier. That's one of the key components with any, with any cancer is early detection and treatment. So one of the key components of survivorship is addressing post-treatment side effects. And there can be a number of them as we talked about a little bit earlier, but uh, for, for example, uh, neuropathies, uh, fatigue, um, sexual side effects, um, bowel changes, uh, these are some of the side effects that patients with colon cancer have. Other cancers, of course, will have other side effects as the treatment is different. So this is something that we do our best to try to try to prevent these uh, side effects as much as possible and really want to address them to try to help improve quality of life. Uh, uh, one of the key components after diagnosis of colon and rectal cancer is lifestyle. And so this is probably the most evidence-based of any of the cancers with respect to diet. So there's clear evidence that eating a diet with uh, small amounts or no red meat will help improve uh, su survival after diagnosis. And actually it's been shown to reduce risk of recurrence of the, of the cancer that the patient was diagnosed with. And in addition, may, may help reduce the risk of a second cancer as well. Uh, physical activity is important. Uh, eating a higher fiber diet is, is, uh, is also critical. So all these components are very, very helpful. And the evidence does strongly support that individuals after a diagnosis of colon and rectal cancer can actually, who have a poor diet or decreased or low physical activity prior to the diagnosis can actually um, greatly benefit from those lifestyle changes. So uh, if someone has a poor diet before the diagnosis, changing that diet can actually um, help that individual to reduce the risk of a recurrence of, of that cancer, the same as someone who has a better diet going into the, di with the, going into the diagnosis. And so this is really cr a critical component that these lifestyle factors are highly modifiable. And that's something that we, we can, um, it's again, small changes over a long span of time can have a tremendous benefit. Um, also, other thing besides the dietary modification, I think um, stopping smoking, I think is very, very important as well as um, decreasing the alcohol intake. I think the excess of alcohol and smoking um, can uh, uh, further increase the recurrent cancer. All of this lifestyle modification not only helps with colon cancer, or all in the long run we see preventing uh, uh, lung cancer, coronary artery disease, and uh, quality life uh, improvement. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. We really had had a great time preparing it, and we really want to hear from you. So, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to contact us, boss. 
And this is a, a two-way conversation. Uh, hopefully uh, that uh, you can help us uh, um, for the educator us, as well as if there's any question that we do not know, or we'd be glad to uh, research and let you know. Our uh, next uh, topic uh, gonna be uh, about uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease as well as esophageal cancer. Hopefully you can join us.